Cougs house. All right, folks. I have a big discovery. We can't lose to Eastern Carolina because there isn't an Eastern Carolina. There's a Northern Carolina, a Southern Carolina. There's a North and South Dakota. Wait, wait. They're telling me that that's not that's not the same. Oh crap! You are locked on Cougs. Your daily podcast on the Houston Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Cougars, daily podcast about your Houston Cougars. I'm your host, Houston-born teacher and coach, Parker Anchor, to break down all things Cougs. If your U of H fan or hater came to stop by, please be sure to subscribe down below. That way the podcast can pop up in your news feed each and every day all year long. If you're subscribed, our show will pop there and make it make sure to make Locked On Cougs your first listen of the day. Welcome back to the YouTube channel where we are about a week in, and I think it's going smoothly. It's nice to see each other again. Again, subscribe to this channel, please. We're trying to grow this channel. Once we get to 250 subscribers, we've been giving things away every 250 subscribers, people who leave comments. This first 250 subscribers, we're going to give away Marcus Sasser t-shirt. Looks pretty cool. If you're on YouTube, you can see it. It looks pretty cool. Uh, we got a couple to give away. We're going to give them away to people that are commenting on videos. So to be eligible, first way to get 250 subscribers, so make sure you hit subscribe and then leave a comment. If you got no idea of what to say, tell us if you like thick crust or thin crust pizza. All right, today we're going to talk about some film study I did. You look like I got bags on my shirt. Tell, tell me, tell that I've been watching some of the computer screen all week long. Some film study I did on Eastern Carolina and prep for the football game this weekend. I watched them play. Uh, I watched long stretches of their play, I guess you should say, against UCF, Cincy, and BYU. And in our first segment, we're going to look at things that I'm encouraged by after watching that film. Uh, second segment is going to be things I'm worried about for our offense. And the third segment is going to be things I'm going to be worried about for our defense. And <laughs> let me just say, um, defense could be in for a long day. So <laughs> before we get too far, let's start in the first segment. Um, I am encouraged that other teams were able to find success running the football, namely BYU had a great, great game plan in running off tackle. So in or outside, just in or outside the tackle, B gap, C gap area, but then going at an angle that went from like there to hash to numbers to sideline on down the football field. Because frankly, when I look at what like Houston running back, Stacy Sneed or Houston running back, Tajon Henry do, if they are in the football game, that's going to play right in Houston's favor, right? Houston likes to run a lot of those kind of things, it's not like outside run, but it's certainly not inside run. It's kind of that mid-level stuff. And what's interesting to me is, is that that kind of can help negate, you know, strong pass rushers. There's some good defensive line we'll get to in a minute, Eastern Carolina, but they're not as the kind of guys I'm worried about blocking or like trapping on that edge. So I could look to see some like block down, kick out kind of stuff at the tackles and look to get Stacy Snead again, a running back off tackle going at a hash number sideline kind of trajectory as he goes down the football field now that's not the only guy i want to see running the ball if you've been listening to this podcast regularly since we've been starting it we've been started a little over a month ago at this point um i've been advocating for more quarterback run games since we started this and <coughs> i'm encouraged in looking at the eastern carolina game because frankly it looks like another game that houston should be able to run the football with the quarterback uh, they were susceptible in both byu and cincinnati and a little bit UCF, but not quite the same extent, to a quarterback that can take off on them. Uh, BYU had great success with a quarterback, I want to say draw power. So, like, think tackles doing draw type action and guard center guard doing like block down and wrap around like a power. Um, quarterback takes a one, two, three drop and takes off following the guard. Um, now, this could be an RPO that. You know, it's hard to tell if some of the stock blocking is like them reading it as well on the outside. So without knowing if it's RP or not, I do think it's going to be why you had so much success with that quarterback draw power kind of stuff. And I think that's the kind of stuff that Clayton Toon can do and do really, really well. Now, I say all of that to say that, like, we haven't seen enough of that, in my opinion, on the season. And I don't know if that's because, like, Dana Holgerson knows that, like, every game kind of rides on having a healthy Clayton tune and that 10,000 yard arm and those kinds of things. So is it we want to run him. And <clears throat> as we've kind of gone further in the season and seen so little of the backup quarterbacks, I, I guess that's kind of the only logical thing I can think of is like, Oh, maybe that's what's going on there. But 
man, I, I just feel like Houston ought to be using Toon's legs more. They're a real weapon. And frankly, in combining my first two things here, the off-tackle run and the quarterback run, I am encouraged to think that like some of the best Clayton Toon designed runs I feel like we've seen this season have been like he's running to the left, right? He's going to run like quarterback counter left. So left tackle blocks down, left guard blocks down, center blocks down. Right guard comes around to kick out, boom. Right tackle or an H-back, someone will probably follow to lead through as a lead blocker. And Clayton Toon is looking to the right side, right? All that's happening on his left side. He's looking to the right side at like a basic slant arrow concept to try and open up Tank Dell. Or maybe Sam Brown runs to the sideline, right? He pumps there, looks there, and then if it's, you know, a guy vacates the box, he can run following the power or the counter or whatever to the backside. <coughs> if they stay in the box to stop the quarterback powder, power counter, he spits it out and shoots it out the outside. And I think that that's really kind of the stuff that I think is going to be there this game form again. And I, I, I just don't know why we don't do it. Other things I think are positive is that, uh, BYU likes to go man to man on the backside of things. And we know we have pro potential wide out tank Dell on that backside. Often I imagine that's a win now kind of play. Um, as far as other things with tank Dell, I can see him getting vertical on these guys, Cincinnati and BYU, but we're both at various points, of their games able to get vertical behind the ECU defense. And I think tank Dell has that kind of speed, if not better speed, frankly, to get behind those guys. We've seen Matthew Golden do it as well in his short stint since he's been back from injury. We know Sam Brown's that kind of guy. Um, Houston's got a lot of guys, I think, that can put on the speed burners at wide out <coughs> and get behind these guys for big, big plays. And so between their their legs and Clayton Toon's arm, I think we got a real chance. Now, I, I think that's a lot of pros for the offense. And the defense has taken a lot of crap lately. And I think that's worth pointing out that there are things about this I'm encouraged for the defense side of the ball, too. Like, ECU will turn the ball over. They will put it on the ground. They will throw it to us uh, and, or give us a chance to make a play on the ball, at least while it's in the air. And I think that, you know, if Doug Belk has been – defensive coordinator Doug Belk has been talking about getting his defense back on track, this might be the game to start that, at least the first meaningful one, right? Um, I, I guess – we saw what happened at SMU a week later. Temple wasn't great. And so is this kind of a game where it's like, no, we really are being back to playing some Houston Cougar football. Uh, we'll see. The other thing is that um, the quarterback likes to make the big, the Eastern Carolina quarterback likes to make big plays. That also means he holds on to the ball a long time. So I think Houston Cougar fans were a little dis- you know, discouraged last week when Temple was spinning the ball out pretty fast. Boom, 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 right? Fast, fast, fast. And that can be because we think about the Houston defense being so like sack heavy sack Avenue, right? The D line, but that's because the D line has to have time to get to the quarterback. And if he's just catching a snap and a shotgun and spitting out right away, there's not a whole lot they can do, right? This Eastern Carolina guy holds on to a little bit longer. And while he might try and get out of his hands early against us, because that's our strength, I think it's a chance for sack Ave <coughs> to really show up. Now Houston is an underdog on most betting sites in this game. And this episode is actually brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. Now, Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to spice up college football. Um, I looked specifically at the Oregon football game because, A, they don't have the Houston game listed, and, B, I, frankly, have been looking at Oregon stuff. I did a great talk with Spencer. You're going to check out the bonus basketball episode that comes out today. Um, he's the host of Locked on Ducks. And, you know, I was looking at this game, and Cameron Rising is quarterback at Utah. The over-under set for him on Underdog Fantasy is 244.5 passing yards. Now, I wonder if that's set really low. I'll let you hear what Spencer says on the podcast over there. Let's go check that one out as well. I think I'm taking the over. Um, I'm not going to tell you what Spencer took, so you need to go listen to that. But I think I'm going to take the over. 244.5 feels low against this Oregon defense. Um, so that's what I'm going to go with. I'm going to go with the over 244 and a half passing yards. Now, remember on underdog fantasy, you can sign up the promo code locked on. It's all one word. Underdog will give you double of your deposit up to hundred dollars. That means you deposit hundred dollars. You get hundred dollars for free. You go to underdog fantasy.com or use the underdog fantasy app in the app store, or Google play store. That's underdog fantasy promo code locked on. Get in the college football pick them action today. Now in looking at, <laughs> In this segment, we're going to look at 
things that worry me because I don't, and I don't mean to do two segments on things that worry me and one segment on things that don't. But if I'm being frank with you, there are more things that worry me about this game. I feel fairly confident that we're going to score a lot of points. So this segment on things that worry me about the Eastern Carolina defense is a little bit lighter, right? Uh, there's not quite as much. I think this could be the kind of game where Houston scores a whole lot of points, right? I think Houston could score a whole lot of points. And I think Clayton Doom could have a field day with Tank Dell and Matthew Golden running past these guys. I mentioned that at the top, the opening segment, what I think Stacey Sneed, and if we really have Tejon Henry back, what we could do running the football against these guys. However, it's got to be runs off tackle because up the middle, East Carolina has some real, real beefy guys, right? Uh, number 40 is a linebacker, Chance Bates. Um, he's a big old guy that you see play a lot in the inside run game. I got his uh, height and weight pulled up here one second. I was looking at all these guys. They got some big old dudes in the middle of that defense. Yeah, he's listed at 6'1", 240. That's a big old linebacker sitting there in the middle of the field. And again, that's the linebacker, not a defensive lineman. 6'1", 240. And he's a really, really good job of plugging holes up the middle. So we're going to have to run off tackle and kind of get away from that guy. Um, number 90, Elijah Morris is a defensive tackle. Um, and he's listed at 6'1", 275. I got to be honest. I was surprised to see him under three bills. He carries his 275. Like it looks like it's a lot in his chest, shoulders, arms. He's a big, big guy. And then 96 is also a, I guess he's listed a defensive lineman, but he's a nose tackle in every sense of the fashion. He's six foot 285. Um, and all three of those guys are really, really violent at the point of attack, like hand fighting, head butting, you know, underneath pad level, driving guys off the ball. It's all right there between the guards, right? They really, really, those three guys dominate between the guards. And frankly, <clears throat> if I'm thinking about like, you know, Stacey Sneed's biggest runs have started, you know, I think he's an off tackle back. I think his most comfortable spots have looked out there. Um, but for whatever reason, Holgerson still sends him up the gut two or three times a game and more of like an inside short trap kind of play where like they trap the defensive tackle or something. And I don't see that working this week, right? I just don't see that working against this defensive front that the Eastern Carolina Pirates are going to run. And unfortunately, I don't know. I don't mean to bash Hogerson. He does some things very, very well. But unfortunately, it does feel like there's some things that he doesn't adjust to that I feel like are, you know, fairly obvious when you watch some tape. And I, I wonder if he just, you know, he trusts his guys. No, we're going to go make those plays up to gut. <laughs> I watch this. I'm thinking, I don't know if we can do that. Right. Um, and so I, I hesitate. I don't think Holgerson will hesitate. And so we'll probably see a few negative or, you know, one yard runs up the middle. And I just don't need to have a big 285 pounds. Sean J. Morris, the no, the defensive tackle, landing on Stacey Sneed wrong. I think he's been a really productive back. I've really liked watching Stacey Sneed play. I don't need him running in there any more than I have to. Now, as poor as I think their defensive ends play the run, the East Carolina defensive ends are good at forcing holding calls. And what worries me about that, and I can see you nodding, and so you're on the same page as me, Houston gets a lot of penalties. We're still one of the most penalized teams in college football, for a long stretch of the season, we were the most penalized team in college football. And this feels like, I mean, there will be some false starts and those kinds of things too, because we are Houston. That's what we tend to do. But this seems like it's the kind of game that is ripe for holding calls, right? Because Toon's going to have hold the ball a little bit because we're trying to get behind them and run deeper route concepts, which means that there's more time for the defensive lineman to get off the ball, which means the offensive line has to block for longer which means a defensive line that's already fairly good at getting the offensive line to hold with various deeks, dunks, and getting off block kind of moves suddenly does it more often. And suddenly, Houston's racking up holding penalties, and I'd imagine you'll see four. Like If I'm putting the over-under, I'd set it at four and a half, and I'd go just under. <clears throat> but if the over-under were set at three and a half, I think I'd have to take the over, and that'd be really... De- but I think Houston's going to get four or more holding calls, right? Um... The other thing, and it's like only word me, like I think back to like the, the Houston Navy game or there's a big spot in the SMU game, I guess. Um, I 
Eastern Carolina tackles to force fumbles. You see it the way that they tackle the ball up high, arms out like spider monkey, where spider monkey out here super wide, and they're coming out and popping the ball down, right? Um, you also see them, at, you know, with one, if one guy has any kind of sort of wrap up, the second guy is coming in and popping the football out. They're clearly, clearly, clearly turnover focused. Now, I'm not worried about Clayton Toon throwing to the wrong team. So when I say the turnover focused, they also hawk the ball. And I think that's why they give a big play in the pass game. I'm not worried about Clayton Toon there, right? Quarterback Clayton Toon will take advantage of that, I'm sure. But I am worried about once they catch the ball, us popping him out because we've seen even Tank Dell. Again, we call him Tank for a reason. And we've seen him cough up the ball if he gets popped in just the wrong way. And I'm not saying that I could take those hits either, Tank. Don't take it personally. I do think, though, that that's the kind of thing that could be a little bit worrisome, right? That could be a little bit worrisome to see happen over and over again to Tank Dell. So I I anticipate Tank Dell having a bunch of targets. I don't think it'll diminish his targets many stretch. But as I sip my tea here, I do worry that, you know, those kinds of moments could happen. We can have a fumble, hopefully not at a big point. Like a second quarter fumble does, if you can like manage it with your defense, hit a little bit different than the fourth quarter fumble does, right? And so maybe I'm worrying about nothing, but I am worried about it. <laughs> I am I am worried about it. Speaking of things to worry about, um, you know, no secret here, I'm over 30. And when I go play pickup basketball, I am dead the rest of the day and most of the next morning my body just does not recover the same way it used to but i started finding a way to fix it and so i'm here to tell you about it as well um so nugenics total t is the product that will help you resolve that soreness and kind of get through those kinds of things and it contains uh, man boosting key ingredients like testophen it's been validated in five different clinical studies shown to boost free testosterone levels in men because Nugenics Total T boosts free testosterone uh, faster than the aging process robs you of, will rob you of it, you'll feel stronger, leaner, more energy, drive, and more passion, too. Uh, while every product professes quality, many other products use generic ingredients that are far less than clinical grade. With Nugenics Total T, you get the same clinical potency levels used in the trials, and Nugenics' formula uh, is backed by 10 years, 10 years of science and research. Nugenics Total T is number one selling testosterone booster at GNC. It can help you re-energize your life and get back to the powerful, confident, and good-looking warrior that you used to be. Now you can get a complimentary bottle of Nugenics Total T when you text the word COLLEGE to 231231. Text now and get a bottle of Nugenics Nitro or Nugenics Thermo, the most powerful fat incinerator ever, with key ingredients to help you get back in shape fast. Absolutely free. Text college 231 231. That's college to 231 231. Now is we're the part of the show that um, you know, speaking of making me feel old, this segment makes me feel really old because we're gonna talk about how uh, groggy the defense is gonna make us feel. I don't know. The the truth is is that I am worried about the Eastern Carolina game in large part because I'm worried about what their offense will do to the Houston defense. It's going to make them look old and slow. I guess it's the metaphor I was trying to go to a second ago. They've got a running back um, that I think in my notes, I circled, highlighted, and made really, really starred all around it and everything. The kid's name is Keaton Mitchell. And what I put in my notes there that got all the attention is he plays like a Coog killer. Right, he's the kind of running back that Houston, for several years now, has just had trouble with. Right, he is not huge, but fairly well built, a little shorter, and he uses the entire fifty-three and a third of uh, fifty-three and a third yard width of the football field. I mean, he will be running an off-tackle zone left and cut it back and go to the right sideline before he scoots to the field for a sixty-yard touchdown. He's got to run a four two five four three. He is. He looks so fast on film that I just feel like he's the kind of guy that Houston's gonna have a lot of trouble with because we saw what Houston did with Temple Sadie. We saw what Houston even did in the SMU game. <coughs> and part of that, I guess, was an overcorrection to the outside pass stuff that team was running. But we saw Houston give up a lot of stuff up to gut at, at various points in the fourth quarter of that game as well. And, 
we saw what uh, b- the Batik kid did from South Florida. Like running backs like this that are just like shorter, stockier, but have the speed give Houston a lot of problems. And Keaton Mitchell is kind of that guy. He's also just kind of a beast. Um, he racks up yards and when he gets in the open field. He like seamlessly goes from striding it out like two and a half yard strides to buckling his hips down, putting a foot in the ground and getting side to side and away from a defender at the second and third level. He's a really, really impressive back. And if you weren't playing Houston, he's a really fun watch, frankly. Like he's a fun watch against BYU. He's a fun watch against Cincinnati. He's just not going to be a very fun watch against Houston because I, I think he's going to make some guys miss. Um, he's certainly not their only threat. Uh, CJ Johnson is a big, strong receiver that reminds me and body type of Rasheed Rice. Remember, Rasheed Rice is the big, strong receiver from SMU uh, that's probably going to be a first-round pick. Um, he gave Houston nightmares, and Houston kind of had to like double-team him and leave a lot of guys open. They've got C.J. Johnson listed at 6'2", uh, 225, which I guess is about an inch shorter, maybe two inches shorter than Rasheed Rice. But looking at the field, I feel like he looks like a, more like a 6'3", 6'4", so I don't know when that measurement was taken. Um Johnson's a really good ball catcher, a really, really good guy to time up. Like, so he, he's running a fade route and the corner's next to him. Like the corner is not looking at the ball. The corner's looking at the receiver, no one to play. Right. And that's what your coach should do. Like that is the best coaching method typically for a corner. But Johnson seems to know that. And what's interesting is like, he is per- so good at waiting to like the absolute last second to make a play on the ball so that he is catching the ball as the defense is reacting like the oh crap moment where they realize he's about to catch the football. Um, I also think it's really impressive to watch him. It's not necessarily jump balls, but fight for fade balls. Like to put the ball up in the air and he doesn't go up and high point it. I mean, he can, but that's not what he's doing in this case. He is more like, like a running box out with the DB as he's working towards the ball falling in his lap, right? Like balls coming up and then down and he's running just in like shoulder, shoulder and then watch the ball fall in his lap. And he's really, really good at a lot of different things that all involve catch the football. And he's also stupid fast. And I don't know what Houston's going to do to get over that. I just, I have, I have worries about him in the back half. And if Houston has to get into different bracket coverages and doubles and those kinds of things, we saw what doing those to Rashid Rice in the SMU game did to the rest of their wideouts, right? It felt like some of those guys were running butt naked open all over the football field. And that's a real, real problem. But the problem that, like, I think, and I don't mean to make this thing quarterback centric, but the problem that I think that, like, is going to show up a lot is this Holton Ehlers kid, the quarterback at Eastern Carolina, is a fifth year starter, a fifth year senior, I should say, that has only missed seven starts in his five years, right? The COVID year overlaps in there somewhere. And so <coughs> he's from. Eastern Carolina, which apparently is not a state, but is an area. And he's a fiery kind of guy, a passionate kind of guy. And frankly, the kind of guy that like, I'm sure wants to end America stand in Houston stand in the American conference on a win. I'm sure he wants to do it at home because Houston's on the road this weekend, obviously in front of all of his home crowd fans. Um, it's our last home game. It's uh, I don't know if it's senior night or homecoming or whatever, but like the, I assume it's at least senior night because it's the last home game. And like, man, oh man, that feels like a recipe for like the big like rah rah crown the guy kind of performance. And he's kind of had that kind of a career, right? Um, that's not to say that he's not also really really good, right? He has a really really good job. I thought watching film of using primarily the close sideline, but both sidelines and putting it like in this pocket between if you try to zone them, I should say between the low corner and the high safety or putting in the pocket between if they go to cover four between the linebacker and the safety, he's really, really good at finding those windows, putting the ball down, which means that you've got to man these guys a lot, at least underneath. And like, what worries me about that is the speed of some of these other guys. Right. And so like suddenly it's kind of a, you know, screwed if you do screwed, if you don't kind of situation, and I'm not sure what Houston does. Again, he does move around the pocket for a long period of time, and I think Houston can get after him with Sack Avenue. I mentioned on the top of the show is things I was positive and optimistic about. But while he's running around like a chicken with his head cut off, his receivers are running far, and he's got a big arm. And so if you don't get to him, you could be in for hurting. And, you know, 
we saw what Houston did and struggled with when Tanner Mordecai did this kind of stuff. Very similar quarterback at SMU, right? SMU is increasingly looking like a middle of the pack bowl team in every game that's not against Houston. And that is fairly concerning because I would not call this Eastern Carolina team middle of the pack by any stretch. They're six and four, just like Houston is. So I guess they look fairly similar, but they've got some impressive offensive weapons. And that's really, really worrying. Now we can fret together. So don't feel alone. We can talk about all day long, assuming Twitter's still around on Saturday. You can find me at Painsworth 512 P A I N S W O R T H five one two on Instagram and Twitter and all the social media platforms you want to, because it looks like some of them might, might be going away. Again, that's Painsworth 512. I'll talk all things Cougs, Rockets, Astros. I guess we can talk about the Texans. I don't like talking about the Texans. They're not very good, but we can talk about them if you want to. Um, we'll also talk Houston Cougar basketball. we got a bonus episode coming out today. We should talk to the host of Locked on Ducks to preview the Oregon game Sunday night. So be prepared for all things U of H, all things Cougs, all things Houston, all the time. It's Pains with 512. Thank you so much for making Locked on Cougs your first listen of the day. If you're looking for a second listen, I'd like to recommend Locked on Rockets. Locked on Rockets is Jackson Gatlin doing a great job of breaking down the Rockets in their young season. The Rockets beat the Mavs on Wednesday night, so he's got some positive things to talk about, I think. Right, Jackson? Maybe. Uh, anyway, hey, go check them out for your second listen of the day. Locked on Cougs is a proud member of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Go Cougs.